great sweep of history transcends time and geographical boundaries. Human events and endeavours are often inextricably linked across the globe, making the wealth of our collective experience seem connected in profound ways. Hi, I'm Dr Sam Chadwick from the University of Chester History and Archaeology Department and I'm here today to talk to you about the Great Siege of Chester. A dark and tumultuous time during the English Civil War in the 17th century, an often overlooked period in our island's history that left over 180,000 people dead across Britain. Tantalising reminders of the conflict are hidden in plain sight, in the fabric of Chester today, its popular places and even in the very streets themselves. It's tempting to think of nations as isolated from the events and the tides of history elsewhere. But the seeds of Chester's terrible siege started nearly 200 years before the Civil War actually broke out. And over half a continent away from our fair city. In 1453, the Ottomans laid siege to the Byzantine capital of Constantinople, present day Istanbul. Constantinople had the best of medieval defences. Despite being dramatically outnumbered, its defenders stood behind strong, tall walls in a supposedly impregnable fortress. Supported by ships to allow it to survive a long siege. It should have been able to hold out for a significant time, allowing for reinforcements. However, the Ottomans had with them efficient gunpowder cannons, which brought down the grand medieval walls within two months. This is often considered a sign of the end of the medieval period and a start of the early modern world. These artillery pieces, along with large, highly organised and well-maintained armies, became the norm throughout the whole of Europe, dubbed by some historians as a military revolution. This theory encompassed improved gunpowder from the Middle East, more organised armies across the continent, and even to star forts stretching as far as Ireland. Some historians thought that gunpowder would make these old medieval fortifications obsolete and that only star forts could resist this new technology. However, here at Chester, we have evidence that shows fault in this idea. In 1642, the English Civil War erupted between the Royalists and the Parliamentarians two broad coalitions fighting over a multitude of things, from representation, equality, freedom and religion, to power and money. There was a scramble for cities and resources and to get as much ordnance as possible. Skilled German and Dutch engineers were imported from the continent and the king's nephews were considered particularly valuable because they had experience in the European campaigns. Chester, which was initially neutral, came under royalist control by 1643. Its first defences were long and quite fragile, keeping all the rich houses in the suburbs protected. Prince Rupert, the elder of the king's nephews, came and tightened up the defences, pulling down and burning many of these houses, upsetting quite a few important people and updating the fortifications. In a short year later, Chester would be under siege. Initially, this was loose and haphazard, the parliamentarians were worried a relieving royalist army would come and catch them, trapping them between the hostile city and a large external force. But as the royalist armies were beaten in successive battle after battle, the parliamentarians tightened their noose around Chester. The outer modern defences fell, not to this revolutionary technology, but to a quick sneak attack. The old medieval city walls, however, they held out, allowing the royalists a place to regroup, the parliamentarians in turn set up batteries to bombard the city, including an artillery piece at St. John's. If you know where to look, there's surviving evidence of cannon fire hidden in plain sight. So here at Barnaby's Tower, we can see the old medieval walls and the cannonball marks where the 17th century ordnance actually hit the masonry. However, unlike at Constantinople, Chester's medieval walls held. 
Built of large facing stones with a sand core, the city's walls provided a fantastic defence against the shot. Indeed, over six months of tight siege and very heavy bombardment, only a small section of the city walls actually fell, with the largest being here at the Roman Gardens. Large ordnance at St John's battered a decayed piece of the walls, supported by a flanking cannon up in the tower that kept defenders away. After months of battery, in an evening in October, these guns eventually brought down a small section of the wall, barely 25 foot wide. Had the parliamentarian commanders been competent, they would have quickly stormed the breach, taking advantage of the surprise. However, they delayed till the night, giving the defenders and citizens time to reinforce the breach with mattresses to suppress the shots and traps to delay an assault. When the assault came, the defenders were ready. Not only that, but the locals helped the defence. During the assault, a visiting French gentleman joined the fray, almost as naked as his sword. By the end of the attack, even the women of Chester were all afire, striving through a gallant emulation to outdo our men. The assault was repulsed, and the besiegers went back to firing at the city, trying to breach the walls and bombard the city into surrender. However, when Chester finally did surrender after six months of tight siege, its walls were mostly intact, and really, its population was only brought low by starvation and the loss of the royalist cause throughout the country. Here in Chester, the destructive firepower of the European military revolution proved ineffective. Strong fortifications and stubborn defiance were a match for this new technology, but at a terrible human cost.